Hi, this is Rick Nowak with the Intelligent Automation Practice, part of Capgemini Invent in North America. Uh, today, we're talking about expanding RPA through intelligent automation. Um, as we've talked about scale of RPA uh, programs, scaling through intelligent automation is all about adding technology and innovation in smart ways. So what we'll be covering is just getting into what is intelligent automation. The, the term is thrown around uh, out in the industry a lot, uh, but we're going to take a look at what takes your automation program and makes it an intelligent automation program. Part of that is going to be adding technology. How do we innovate smartly in ways where we're cutting down the learning curve costs and maximizing the opportunities that we get from that innovation? Identifying technology opportunities, places where we can apply new technologies and, and find ways to bring about better results. We're going to talk about scaling your RPA program. How do I integrate these technologies with my existing RPA program to get more out of it? And then the overall vision of completing the technology stack. So most organizations take a similar journey through their experiences with automation and, and RPA. Um, we track those journeys on two sides. One side is the technology and one side is the governance. Um, in, in the previous webinar, we spent a good amount of time discussing the, the governance side of this. Uh, so right now we're going to focus a little bit on the top part of that journey on the technology side uh, with a little bit of governance thrown in. So the typical technology journey for any organization starts off with, uh, you know, your basic proof of concept, making sure that RPA is, is the right technology for you, that you're going to get benefits from it, and building that into a pilot implementation. Typically in the pilot, you're going to build one or two automations for your organization, and in the process, you're going to learn how best to govern, how best to build a, a mechanism by which to deliver, and then look to get more automation opportunities so that you can build and get uh, more results. You, you don't get a lot from, from one or two bots, but what you learn from building the one or two bots helps you build into scale. Eventually, you get up to the point where you're able to build automation after automation on a steady basis. That gives you the level of, of bot factory where you're just cranking out different uh, assets through, uh, through your RPA program. But it's getting up to that next level that is oftentimes a challenge for companies. Uh, we go into looking at RPA opportunities with a set of rules um, and, and essentially constraints for automation opportunities. So I, I see organizations where they are, uh, you know, ruling out opportunities that, that use, um, you know, paper-based documents or that have decisions as part of the process or that have uh, complex rules that may change over time. And for, for your standard RPA platform, that might be a little bit difficult to achieve with the base technology. But by adding just a little bit into that, whether it is OCR, ICR, or some machine learning, or, or other technology, you can build up the capabilities that expand what RPA can do so that you can um, use your, your RPA to automate more opportunities. So, Typically with the pilot and, and getting in place your, your RPA program, you're going to build a foundation uh, on top of your, your RPA pro, uh, platform. And whether that platform is a UiPath or Blue Prism or Automation Anywhere or, or any of the technology that's out there, um, the first step, the foundation of this is to build a, a solid RPA platform. And what that means is not just in, installing the software and installing some bots on some virtual machines, but getting a set of governance around the platform, getting some bots into production and finding out what your organization needs from that. Building a center of excellence like we talked about in, in the last webinar where you can 
get some governance and some standardization around your RPA process and actually see what it's doing. Um, and then get your bots managed. Build, build a management platform around your automations so that you have stability within that. And that gives you your basic RPA 1.0 platform. But beyond that, in order to build up to intelligent automation, it's a, a question of adding layers on top of the, that platform. Uh, identifying the new skills that are beneficial to your organization to build into the bots, finding the ways to identify and, and manage the value in the bots that you have, and, and even going so far as to integrate your RPA program into your process transformation. These are the factors that we're going to be talking about on how to get into that top level of scale, that, that, that blue on the top right of the uh, intelligent automation graph. So the foundations for intelligent automation. If you've done any work with RPA, you've seen that there are limitations to what bots can do. Um, most of the tasks that we have within our organizations were designed by humans for humans. Uh, and, and as we build upon these tasks, the software that we're looking to automate is software that was built for humans based upon the, the skills and the abilities that humans have. <clears throat> when we look at what bots can do, those skills differ slightly. There's a lot of overlap in the typical repetitive rules-based tasks that you might see, especially as you're working with internal systems, uh, S SAP and, and Salesforce and PeopleSoft. Um, but then there's also places where they don't overlap. Like humans can look to their experiences and, and make some determinations based on judgment that bots may have quite a bit of difficulty with. Bots may be able to process thousands of rows of data in a few seconds, which may take humans much more time. So there are places that overlap and there's places that are different. The goal of intelligent automation is to expand this area in the middle, the overlap, by giving bots a little bit more capability in the human realm and by helping you to move processes in such a way that they fit a little bit more into the bot realm. And if you think of it, it's really just you know, two groups of, of employees that you're working with. You have your human employees, and you have your electronic employees. To get a human to do a new task, you have to train that person in the new task. Bots are also trained into the new tasks. Um, the difference is the initial cost of training of a bot may be a little bit higher, but the good news is as you scale and you add more bots, that training is applied across the new bots um, with minimal cost. Bots obviously do better at repetitive work, while humans do better at critical thinking and creative work. So what we wanna do is we want to identify the best of those skills and, and build a flow that lets the two work together. As bot skills advance, the lines between the bot and human skills begins to blur. And that's, that's the blur that we want to create just a little bit more of. So in developing skills for our workforce, our human workforce has skills. We train them on, on using Excel. People learn how to uh, read emails and, and kind of sort and categorize emails and prioritize responses. Um, and, and we teach humans skills like processing invoices. These are all basic skills that we can train our electronic workforce in as well. But when you're looking at building new bots, instead of looking at it from the perspective of using Excel to do a certain task, you want to start to look at your technology in terms of training your bot to use Excel in general. What are those general things that we want to train your electronic workforce for so that we have that as a reusable skill across new automations that we build? Reading emails. You know, we can get a bot to open an email and grab an attachment but can the bot look at emails from different sources with different intents and then categorize those and perform the, the correct actions off of those? Um, 
giving it skills like processing invoices. Have, have we covered all of the different things that have to occur during that particular task? If you just automate one single task, you have not necessarily uh, automated the entire invoice process. But you can certainly look at, at the variations of skills necessary for processing invoices and start building some reusable components for bots to be working with invoices. Some of the more advanced skills, um, you know, humans, we train them a lot more for, for broader range of skills individually. So <clears throat> humans can be a train, trained for things like, you know, accounting and finance people, customer service people, HR functions. And, and as part of that, you're adding in certain skills, you know, in customer service, uh, you're, you're adding in skills like being able to, to deal with people over the phone and being able to answer questions. Um, as you're looking at those particular roles and looking to automate those roles, you also want to look at which of these skills can be transferred over into, uh, into bot specific skills. And that's where the bots actually do get just a little bit more specific because I can't train a bot to do somebody's entire job, but that's really not the purpose of RPA. The purpose of RPA is to take some away from each job and, and, and open up productivity or give us, give us a cost savings. So, I can train them into a, a, a little bit more specific tasks, but I want to look at those tasks in terms of end-to-end uh, -end tasks. And we'll look at that a little bit deeper in, in a slide or two. Plan to train your bots in skills that transcend the processes, though. You want to create as much as you can reusable functionality because processes do change over time and, and business needs do change over time. But by building bots skills instead of just individual tasks, you're making your bots in, in ways that are much more configured and much, much more adaptable uh, to those changes. Um, but the only way that you're going to be able to integrate that within your program is to add uh, <clears throat> the ability to maintain and track and update your, your skills library. So there should be some internal awareness as to the library of skills that have been added into the bot. And that's all part of this scaling up technology. What have you done beyond the capabilities of RPA and how do you use that? So exploring new skills. There's a ton of new great technologies out there that can easily be plugged into your RPA program or adapted to your RPA program. There's advancements in machine learning and computer vision and intelligent character recognition and workflow tools. There's just a ton of things out there. Uh, but you can spend a lot of money investigating new technologies. And if you don't have a place to implement it, then it's not going to do a whole lot of good for you. So what we like to do is, is to look across all the different processes as as we're identifying opportunities for automation, uh, when you're working with just basic RPA, uh, you should keep track of those processes that were ruled out for different reasons. You may rule out processes that, um, <coughs> excuse me, you may rule out processes that involve uh, human cognition or, or that involve some sort of experience to make a decision or that you know, read items from, from documents. Um, you want to keep an eye out for those because those are going to be what opportunities are built from in the long term. You also want to look across your tasks for commonalities. So if I'm, if I'm looking at, at a list of incoming uh, RPA opportunities and I see that several of them have the task of logging into SAP or looking up an invoice or, or modifying internal uh, details, um, or you know, creating journal entries towards the end. These are all tasks that, or skills that may differ between tasks, but have some commonalities. So we want to take a look at these and and think of them in terms of building those as reusable objects. Something that when somebody is building a a bot and they're going to have to update something within an invoice, that they can just call that reusable object from the library and and bring it in. Um, this is this should be part of the thought process, even when just evaluating processes for automation, because you might not do all of these automations at the same time. But as soon as you're exposed to 
at least the high level flow of the tasks that are candidates for automation, you should already start looking for those commonalities. So what to do about the different tasks that we have that RPA just can't do by itself? Well, when you're evaluating tasks and you're looking at an end-to-end -end process that may come in, start off with an email request and flow through several people and then um, you know, wind up with, with a specific entry in a system, you might find places within that overall process to replace humans with specific task-based bots. And that is your RPA 1.0 way of thinking. Where can a bot step in here and start helping people out? But over the course of time, the other um, transition strategy that you have to get to RPA 2.0 is to actually start thinking about the process overall. How can I change the process and the way that it works to where it just flows better with bots? Now, we're gonna talk about how to bring technology in to start overcoming some of the technology hurdles, but technology by itself does not create a, a task that is perfect for the electronic workforce. Technology plus some process redesign is what actually gets you there. So consider possibilities of functions and outcomes that were not possible for tasks designed for human skills alone. Look at human skills, look at bot skills, look at the overall process and think about where that can be redesigned. And, and it can't always be redesigned to just be an exclusively bot process. But certainly, you can get some of the parts of the tasks that the bots can do together, add in the technology to do things like the natural language processing or the machine learning to, to streamline it, um, and then make the handoff from bot to, ro to human and to bot uh, easier. So... As you're looking at your processes and you're seeing some of the hurdles that, that stand in the way of applying just basic RPA, um, you're going to want to bring in new technologies that can help to overcome them. Now, these technologies come in, in actually a, a fairly wide range. So I wanna go into some detail to some of the key technologies that we're implementing today. Um, natural language processing. Now, natural language processing is, is, is by far one of my favorite technologies to bring into RPA because I come from a background of uh, user interface improvement, making the, the human to technology interface uh, much simpler, more intuitive, easier to use. And it's the same thing that I try to apply a lot more to RPA. Uh, it, it's oftentimes frustrating to me when I see a, a RPA bot that you know, receives an email from a human and it has to have a very specifically formatted um, Excel attachment. It has to have a very specific um, formatting to its subject line before the bot can even do anything with it. With natural language processing, we can make it a lot easier for humans to send requests into the bot in the same way they would be able to send a request to somebody else. Um, you know, imagine uh, imagine an email coming in from a person uh, you know, requesting details on a specific invoice that might be in dispute. Now, if I'm internal to a company, I can format that in a very specific way and send it into a bot. But if I'm getting requests from outside the company, that language may differ significantly between emails. But we've seen natural language technology um, in, in, in some really great forms. If you think about what, what you're able to do with with Alexa and what you're able to do with, with Google search and, and have it really quickly figure out what your intent is, um, even though you and I may, very, may write very different queries when we go into search Google or when we might ask Siri a question, we still get very similar results because it's able to use natural language to extract our intent. So we're gonna explore some of the areas where, where natural language can be applied and, and make that, um, much easier. Now, I also include workflow tools with this because uh, along with natural language as an interface, we also want to have some smart interfaces in working with bots um, in, in passing information. Sometimes you do have to structure data and, and send it in, but 
beyond just filling in an Excel form, there's a lot of other ways to do that. There's workflow tools, you know, like like SharePoint and, and Pega and, and several different others that actually make it a lot easier to flow data in and out um, and, and give the people a, a much easier way to, to fill in forms, fill in information um, and, and continue that flow. Uh, OCR, ICR, <clears throat> this is an area of technology that, that is just exploding right now. Um, and, and that includes using machine learning to, to do things like reading invoices and POs, but we, we've also seen it take off in, in great directions with uh, computer vision, being able to, to spot objects, being able to uh, identify purposes to forms and categorize uh, incoming forms and documents. Um, so that's kind of a big one on the radar. And then of course, machine learning. Uh, one of the biggest problems with, with rules-based RPA is that it, it has a, you know, if, if you're just strictly rules-based, then you're not easily adapting to, to changes uh, in, in the business or changes of information. So machine learning lets you give a bot experience and, and make some basic decisions based upon that experience. So this means taking upon new technologies. And with new technologies, there is a need to do basic innovation. Um, so while the companies that have developed a lot of these different types of solutions have done their own innovation in, in building the solution, like for example, when, when it comes to OCR and ICR and computer vision, I don't have to do the actual work of creating a, a computer vision algorithm that is going to identify different products. That work has been done. Um, by by computer scientists ar around the world. But the innovation part is how am I going to plug that in into my specific needs? Um, and that is actually going to differ by organization. You might be using computer vision to read incoming um, you know purchase orders or, or shipping documents or, or you know, other types of information like that, paper-based information to figure out what's on your warehouse shelves. Or you might just be taking a picture to figure out what's on your warehouse shelves and let the bot figure out what it's seeing in the picture, much like a human would. So how you're going to use the technology is going to differ based upon what you intend to do. That's why all of your innovation needs to start with use cases. You don't adapt new technology just for the sake of the new technology because it's shiny and new. What you want to do is find the use cases where that's going to come in handy. Where are the different places in my organization where I might be able to use that computer vision? And once I've identified the use cases, I can find out the specifics of how that's going to be used and best identify which solution fits that. Evaluate the new technology. There's a lot of promises out there to, to technology, and there's a lot of neat things that people say that they've done with machine learning and computer vision but is it something that is practical for what you're looking to do? So before we take off on a, on a pilot to bring in the computer vision to scan the pictures to see what's on our warehouse shelves, we wanna do just a basic evaluation of the technology. I, I would go into um, you know, Google Vision or, 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 or Microsoft's platform or whatever you're gonna try and run through a couple of samples of, of what you're looking to have it do before you even bother doing the integration with RPA. That way you can find out a little bit more about the limitations of the technology that you're looking to use and the suitability for your particular use case. Once you have identified that a technology works for you, <clears throat> the next step is to sit down with the architects and, and build the standards and practices around that. Because you're going to find that as you implement a technology, you're going to start using it across different use cases. And as you use it across different use cases, you need some consistency in how it's used and make sure that you're able to maintain the, the quality standards necessary, the quality standards that hopefully you've already uh, applied to the rest of your uh, RPA program. So how are you going to develop it? How are the reusable components going to be built? What is your, your testing plans look like for this type of thing? What does the deployment look like? Um, what are the particular security policies and concerns around that? 
Um, how is it going to be maintained over time? All of that type of thing is, is built into your uh, standards and practices for a given technology. And that should be incorporated in and documented for use before anybody starts developing off of it. <clears throat> then you're going to build the reusable objects. I don't want to build my use case just for that individual use case. I want to make sure that as I start to use computer vision, for example, I'm going to build it into a reusable platform. So this today, I may be taking pictures of what's on, on a warehouse shelf um, and, and identifying products. Um, tomorrow, I might be using it to identify competitive products across the web that are similar to my products. That's why I want to build these in such a way that they are really following just object-oriented standards so that I have some reusability between use cases. So let me dive just a little bit deeper into uh, each of these technologies, um, get some familiarity as to, to what we're working with. So documents and vision, OCR, ICR, actually breaks up into a lot of different uh, capabilities. And what I'm hitting here is just some of the common capabilities that are just now being brought into RPA and the intelligent automation world. But it goes much further than what, you, what you're seeing here. This is, again, it's a technology that's evolving very quickly. And as, as more people apply more use cases and have different requirements, this is going to continue to expand. But optical character recognition has been around for a long time. Um, your most basic optical character recognition is just taking what's on a piece of paper and turning it into text. Um, usually also uh, providing with that um, some sort of, of relative positioning for that particular information. So a, a lot of business processes start and end with paper forms. If you have a very structured form, you may be able to get away with basic uh, OCR. Um, but OCR has difficulties when you get beyond just kind of a standardized form. Um, anything that involves handwritten text becomes much more difficult because people's handwriting is, is all over the place. Um, unstructured or varying inputs. So like, for example, there's a, a invoice example up here on the page. But invoices, if I compare invoices between many different vendors, everyone is a little bit different in, in what their printed invoices look like. Um, fax documents can, can be a, a difficulty. And it's actually surprising how much is, is still being transmitted by fax for different reasons these days. But you degrade the quality of the document, making it a little bit more uh, difficult to read. And then things like check marks and, and signatures. Um, it, it's pretty easy for a human to spot if a, uh, uh, if a part of a form that requires a signature has an actual, actual signature on it. But basic OCR has difficulty uh, determining the difference between a signature and, and, and a coffee stain. So um, certainly it's a place where, where you might need some added capabilities. And, and that's where intelligent character recognition comes in. ICR just takes regular OCR and applies uh, intelligence through machine learning um, into the optical character recognition. So take the example of invoices. When I have a new invoice with a new format that comes in using OCR, I have to go in and I have to point out to OCR that for this particular vendor, the invoice number is located on the top right and the invoice date is located you know, an inch and a half below that and slightly to the left. So I have to train my, my OCR, basically create a new template for it to find the, the different items within the invoice. But with machine learning, what I can do is I can have it learn from batches of invoices over time. What the bot needs to know <coughs> is what the locations are from its OCR, text recognition, and what the outputs should be, which it can pick up from your SAP system or, or uh, Oracle or wh wherever you have your invoices stored. And by comparing what the invoice is text-wise to what the invoice should be data-wise, it's actually learning how to find the right positioning of that text. 
Uh, we've had some really good results from a couple of the different uh, ICR options that are out there for for um, for creating machine learning on, on invoices. Um, and it's one of those places that is, is continuing to expand beyond invoices into just about any kind of form that you can imagine. The, the trick there is having a good size sampling of previously read and, and completed items versus a data set that you can compare that against uh, of, of what the results should be. And then the machine learning can pick that up. Um, also, when it comes into image recognition, this is another one of those things that is, is you know, picking up very quickly, but it is very specific um, to, to different circumstances. So you can use uh, image recognition to recognize logos, to recognize project products. Uh, it can be used to find you know, easily check boxes on forms, signature detection, handwritten notes on documents. But for this, there's you know certainly different training sets and and, and different uh, solutions that have been created by different organizations that lean either more towards documents or more towards photographs and you're going to have to do a little bit of research to find out which is the right ones and and what plugs in very easily so best practices when using documents in vision, one of the things that I, I oftentimes suggest is um, use what you have. There may very well be in-house solutions already. Um, your organization may have um, an, an Adobe solution or Abby solution or some other solution already in place um, that is being used just for a portion of what its capabilities are. So if you're diving into OCR, ICR, See what software you're already paying for. You might just be able to plug in with your RPA into that existing solution and do what you can. Um, second is don't try to reinvent the wheel. Plug and play wherever you can. So the web is full of innovative solutions from trusted vendors. And I think that's kind of the key. When you're building something as part of your RPA stack, you do want to at least make sure that whatever solution that you're working with is mature enough um, to where it's going to still be there a year from now and 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 follow you know fairly consistent standards so we tend to look at solutions from 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 google and amazon and microsoft and, and others that already have a, a an established name and uh we know the quality that we're going to be getting from them um, certainly, as I said before, evaluate your solutions based on use case. I think this is very important because I've seen a lot of money spent on solutions <coughs> to solve a problem that wasn't entirely there. Um, part of that evaluating solutions based on use case is also making sure that the use case, if you solve the use case, you're going to get enough value to uh, pay for the effort that's going into bringing the technology forward. It doesn't have to be super expensive of an innovation process, but certainly you want to make sure that you're going to get a return on that investment. Um, for OCR and ICR, you have to definitely set expectations that perfect is not possible. Um, <clears throat> even for humans, there, there's some things that is, are just, you know, in, in handwriting, just too difficult for people to read. Um, certainly, there's going to be a lot of things that bots cannot do at this point. There's going to be um, difficulty for them in, in documents that are, are um, you know, come from photographs or documents that come in faxed or documents that aren't consistent or may have, you know, watermarks or logos behind it. Um, so expect that there is going to be a percentage of whatever you're trying to read that is not going to be 100% accurate. Um, for that, you need to make sure that you plan for any uh, machine learning training that is being done to improve your results. And you also need to plan within your RPA for an alternate path. If a bot attempts to process something and it is not able to read it 100% accurately, then what is the path to go from there? How do I hand that document off to a human um, through email or through uh, some form of workflow so that that human now knows that that um, 
that is is in their queue. And then once the human deals with that particular document or that particular item and processes it, are we making sure that the bot is then able to look afterwards, find out what the human result is, and continue the training on the machine learning? So that's all part of the loop that you want to bring in um, while realizing that, that perfection, 100% perfection, is, is not something that we're always aiming for in the document processing and, and image processing world. Um, and as I said before, always publish policies and practices for use. And you may build up separate uh, policies and practices for document processing as you would for image processing. Getting into natural language processing. So bots and humans don't speak the same language. Um, certainly don't even look at things the same way. Um, teaching humans to speak bot means that you're creating some clumsy interfaces, you're, you're putting constraints on, on what humans naturally do. And, and part of the goal of automation in the first place is to make things easier for humans. So we don't wanna focus on teaching humans to work with bots so much as making sure that our bots are easy for humans to work with. Um, there, there's four strategic areas that you probably want to look at when it comes to natural language processing, and, and they each work just a, a little bit differently. Um, first one is, is on the bottom left, the um, natural language processing, which is receiving input from humans. And on this one, I'm using email as an example because that's one of the places where we can certainly make improvements into our bots. Um, it, it can become cumbersome over time to set up different email accounts for every single task that a human may ask a bot to do. So if I have a, a finance bot, I don't necessarily want to have uh, an, an email address <coughs> uh, for invoice input and an email, a, a separate email address for requests for uh, invoice details and, and, and you know, on and on. What I'm typically looking to do is how do I create one email address for a given function where a human can send in emails and the bot can figure out what the intent is based upon the, uh, the subject and based upon, you know, there may be some specifics to the body and, um, and, and attachments that it can use to figure that out. Natural language processing can help to extract those intents from the email. Um, natural language generation, again, something that is very helpful in the bot sending back results. Um, and in, in natural language generation, what you're looking to do is you're looking to, to turn information that the bot gets towards the end of its process into something that can be sent to a human and is done in a meaningful way. Now, natural language generation is probably not so much in, in, in emails, because in, in emails, most of your bots are going to you know, kind of have formatted responses, but you'll see that a lot in, in voice bots and chat bots, what we have on the right-hand side. Um, and, and this is actually opening up almost any kind of speaking activity. A voice bot can be uh, anything from, from a automated phone answering system to uh, you know, using Amazon Alexa, or, or similar technology to where a human can voice interact with bots. Um, and then a chat bot is a way for us to plug in a interactive platform between uh, a, a user and a bot. And that interactive platform can be on a website, it can be within an app on a, on a phone, uh, it can be through text messaging with a bot. Um, and those ways of interactions are ways that are oftentimes very natural to humans but we want to make sure that we're able to build up those interfaces uh, to work properly with our automations. So how chatbots and voice bots work. If you look at a good solid stable platform, it, it gives you an opportunity where you don't have to have a new technology for each of these different solutions. Um, the interfaces, the natural language processors, the bot that might do some of the tasks behind the scenes, these are all layers 
to an auto uh, to to an overall automated approach. So you can find the right provider that has all the pieces of the stack, but this is where it's important to go look at your use cases. Do my use cases support uh, phone calls? Like, am I including customer service or or uh, some kind of phone automated requests as part of that process? Um, am I going to have uh, text-based interfaces? Am I classifying emails? And you can look at solutions uh, by companies, you know, like like Microsoft or Amazon or, or Google that that actually have the different layers and the different approaches that you have, or by getting a good natural language processor um, uh, platform, get something that you can easily plug into with uh, external solutions. So you may look at each piece of this as providing a different solution provider. I might have my bots done in UiPath, my natural language processor um, may be uh, you know, done by in, in, in Microsoft Azure, and then I may have different chat interfaces and voice interfaces and text interfaces that support the level of interaction that I'm looking for. One of the big things when it comes to interacting with people, though, if you are going to replace a person um, when you, uh, for, for talking to a customer or, or talking to a, 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 someone of, of the general public, if you're replacing a person with technology, you have to make sure that the technology is not so narrowly focused that most of the responses wind up going to a human anyhow. Um, so if I'm going to create, for example, a customer service bot, I need to build into it at least a few of my most common customer service call activities so that the majority of people who interact with that bot feel as though they've been serviced prior to just being handed off to a person. If you don't do that, then it just feels like you're adding an abstraction layer to your customer service, which is going to wind up being a customer disservice. So look at the functionality overall and make sure that you're able to provide that. By adding RPA behind the scenes, a lot of times you can use the natural language processor to find out the customer's intent. Are they doing a, a billing inquiry? Are they looking to activate uh, a, a part of their service? Are they looking for account information? And the natural language processor can respond to the person and say, okay, that's going to be sent to your email on record. And the RPA bot can perform the task right there in the background. Um, look at those pieces of functionality. Make sure you take a look at it in, in a layered approach uh, and, and make sure that you make your bots multi-purpose to keep people comfortable working with them. Machine learning. Machine learning expands the capability of RPA into those places where, you know, as, as you're discussing RPA opportunities, they say, uh, oh, we can't use RPA to do that because you need experience to make a certain decision. Um, that's where machine learning comes into play. And machine learning, as I was describing before, is, 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 is pretty simple. Uh, at, at a very high level, in that you're taking data from previous activities and learning all the experience off of that. So if I can see thousands of inputs and I can see thousands of outputs, I let the machine learning figure out how to get from the inputs to the outputs and it can try all kinds of different algorithms in between. I don't even need to see the algorithms, but it figures out which algorithms by trying many, 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 many will get as, as high a percentage of those satisfactory results as, <clears throat> as possible. Um, and that's why when, when machine learning makes a decision, we, we refer to that as a prediction. It's looking at all the past activity that it learns from from, from its, its machine learning. And when it sees a new decision to be made, it makes a prediction of what a human would have answered that or what the result should actually be. So machines are able to, to learn through experiences and they're able to learn through the, those experiences in the past by looking at, at past data. When I'm looking at opportunities for RPA, 
I always want to look in, in the machine learning side in places where I can look at thousands of past inputs and thousands of past results so that I can know my accuracy in advance. Now, I also want to talk about machine learning from the scope of RPA, because before I go and, and, and put an entire team of data scientists onto uh, approving an invoice, I want to say that machine learning for RPA can be significantly simplified. And, and here's really the difference. In RPA, I'm usually trying to make a very simple decision within a very simple task. Um, am I going to approve an expense or am I going to uh, hand that off for a human for a closer look? If, uh, if my machine learning can identify what the common expenses are, I might be able to approve 95% of expense reports and then the ones that don't really fit into my machine learning model hand those 5% off to a human and I've just saved 95% of the work. Um, in higher machine learning for analytics, you might have a team of data scientists that are looking at all of your company's expenses and trying to find incidents of, of fraud or overspending or things like that. So machine learning for RPA is just finding that simple flag. And machine learning for analytics is when I'm looking at typically, you know, big picture things. Um, and I, I, I correlate that difference because in machine learning for RPA, I don't want to create a whole new uh, machine learning engine. I, I want to use some existing uh, functionality that's already out there that I can just kind of plug into. So simple things like flagging in individual invoices for review, doing expense reports, um, determining which customers need to receive payment reminders, things of that nature are, are really simple for, for RPA machine learning because it's really just sort of yes, no decisions based upon history. So there are some common algorithms used in, in um, RPA machine learning. Um, and, and these you can plug into probably whatever your major platform is. And I, and I keep going back to things like uh, you know, Azure and Google, um, but th there's a lot of different machine learning uh, platforms out there that you can actually just plug into. Um, look at your use cases and you'll find that for the most part, the places where you need to do learning uh, is where the bots are just making a simple decision as part of a single task. So machine learning for bots, it's not super complex uh, data science. You can plug into existing platforms um, and you can create that plugin actually as a reusable component. So once you have integrated a single yes, no decision into your bots, you can then use that to uh, create other places where there might be different yes, no decisions. Same thing for multiple choice decisions. So <clears throat> these plug, in, plug into some, some pretty basic machine learning algorithms. Um, linear or, or log logistic regression uh, can help you make simple yes, no decisions. You can use a, a different types of discriminant regression to use uh, you know multi-choice scenarios, even multi-factor inputs. Um, Classification regression trees are oftentimes using, uh, used for determining the best path or, or sorting based on inputs. So you might have different paths that are going to be taken based upon what's coming in. Um, plug these in, test them, make sure that they work for your particular uh, scenario. So a really good example of, of building a bot for machine learning is, you know, not only do we want the bot to be able to learn from what's already existing out there, but we want the bot to stay updated. And I don't want to have to have a data science team come back to reload data. So with when you apply machine learning into a particular task, into a particular process, you're going to do that initial learning up front. Um, but then once you build the bot, one of the important parts is to make sure that the bot is going to feed the data back so that it learns from what the human does. 
Um, so an, an example is I might be having a bot going through expense reports and at some point it's going to flag an expense report because a particular uh, hotel price for a particular city was out of, out of scope. So it hands it to a human to review. Well, that human might look at that and say, oh, well, that, you know, that hotel was in, in uh, New York or San Francisco. So it's a very expensive hotel. We're going to go ahead and approve that. If the bot never goes back in and looks up those results and figures out that for certain cities you can have higher uh, results, then it's never going to learn. So when a bot hands something off to a human, it's pretty important as part of the process to have the bot then look maybe 24 hours later back at that same data and add that into its learning set. Also make sure <coughs> As, you know, as part of that process, if you're going to, to hand off to a human, make sure you have a, a, a viable mechanism to hand off to a human. Make sure the bot is able to do as much as it can. So I might be processing an expense report that has several items and that hotel is just one of the items. Um, I would still like the bot to process all of the other items that it can, hand it off to the human in a way that says, hey, this expense report has one hotel item I want you to take a look at, focus the human's attention on that. And then of course, as I said, after that process is done, be able to review it. So these are a couple of the technologies that we've been applying in, in, in place. Um, these are also technologies that are uh, evolving very quickly. And as they evolve quickly, you're going to build up more and more skills within your RPA program to apply these technologies onto actual business processes. So to wrap up, what I've done is I've, I've created essentially a, a very, very simplified finance process. And if you're in finance, don't look at this and say, oh, well, this isn't you know, near enough detail because it's not. It's not meant to be. This is meant to sort of represent almost any generic process where you have different steps that require different skills. So, for example, I might be sent an, an invoice, you know, through email. I might take that invoice, try to match it up with a with a purchase order. I might have a, uh, a, a approval process um, where I need to uh, approve it for payment. Um, or, and release invoices for payment, and then finally uh, processing the payment of that invoice. So each of these different steps is slightly different skills. And if I come in and I look at, um, you know, for example, the, uh, the, the, the capability of basic RPA, I might realize that I can use basic RPA to do the PO matching and just kind of, you know, look and make sure that everything lines up. And then, you know, the processing of the payment. Once the once everything's been approved, the, the bot can easily process the payment and do the reconciliations and, and all of that. Um, but in other parts, I might look at, you know, hey, in order for me to actually approve invoices, I want to have a human in the loop because that's policy. Or, you know, the overall uh, approval process, uh, you know, requires a little bit of experience. Or you know, the input of the invoice, these are coming in as, as PDFs and somebody has to physically read it. So I'm looking at each of these tasks and realizing as I apply different technologies, I can start to get rid of some of those constraints. So by adding in, for example, uh, OCR and ICR, I can take care of the inputting of the invoice, or at least take care of a lot more of the inputting of the invoice. So um, I receive that email, feed it through my OCR, uh, ICR software, let it extract the data from the invoice and enter it into the system. And then my PO matching becomes, um, you know, the, the next logical step. So now a person doesn't have to touch this until after the, um, the PO matching. But still for invoice approval, it requires a little bit of experience. And that's where I would tend to look into how do I bring in machine learning into that? Through machine learning, <clears throat> can I detect your typical, you know, flags for fraud that a human might be looking for? Can I uh, detect the, the anomalies? Can I determine what really needs to be 
fully um, evaluated by a human and what can just be uh, easily approved with a high level of, um, of accuracy. That's where the machine learning comes in. So now I've taken a process and, and I've taken it to a point where I can automate pretty much all of the tedious tasks and there still might be something like actually releasing the invoice where my company's policy says there has to be a human in the loop. And then I can include that by just making sure that there's a, a good cue that I can hand over to the human and that the, hand, the human can approve and then the bot can pick up to, to process the payment. But <clears throat> by applying different technologies into an overall process, by automating tasks that may not have been as easily automated by RPA previously, I have now focused a lot more of that human's attention onto things that require human cognition and intuition and automated much more of the tedious parts of the process. So hopefully that's what you'll be able to achieve as you build your, your automation stack. So all of this comes down to building the facets that make it possible for you to scale technology-wise. <clears throat> we want to make sure that we have a good solid RPA-based platform in place. We want to make sure that there's good solid governance around that, um, that we have our, our, our practices and, and policies in place for how that program works. As we add in new technologies, we want to integrate it just like we would any other technology stack um, by adding in reusable components. And as you build your technology stack, it gives your developers each easily reusable components that they can use to, uh, to expand the capabilities of what they're developing. So <clears throat> once you have all of these pieces together as, as you're expanding and expanding, that's what gives you overall intelligent automation. You've, you've taken the skills of the bot beyond basic RPA and into a little bit more of a cognitive realm, a little bit more of a working, making decisions with experience, reading documents, classifying things, and talking to people uh, kind of environment. And that is truly intelligent automation. I thank you very much for your time. I hope that this has been helpful to you in your RPA program and in your endeavors. Uh, if you need any more information or if you'd like to uh, talk and discuss aspects of intelligent automation, my email address is rick.noack at capgemini.com. And thank you very much for attending.